Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we move to present-day Charleston Harbor, South Carolina in what would be a huge foobar for the Union in the Second Battle for Fort Sumter that occurred on September 7th and 8th, 1863. The attacking forces commanded by Union Brigadier General Quincy Gilmore our esteemed architect, along with Rear Admiral John Adolphus Bernard Dahlgren, the commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, who in 1847, at the age of 38, was an ordnance officer to Washington Naval Yards and began to improve and systemize the procurement supply system for the entire U.S. Navy's weapon systems. Between the two, and mostly just under Rear Admiral Dahlgren, were 400 sailors and Marines with several boats and at least one U.S. Navy monitor, the Patapsco, all of whom would assault Fort Sumter. In defense of Fort Sumter was one of this channel's favorite returning characters, General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, a trained civil engineer, graduate at West Point, and the first man to be promoted to Brigadier General Confederate Army, and also the recipient of one of our videos specially on him. He was the overall commander of the 320 Confederate defenders at Fort Sumter. As a result, what would prove to be a colossal example of ego and drama, the Confederate forces will easily win. After a heavy bombardment of Fort Sumter in early September, both Major General Quincy A. Gilmore and Rear Admiral John A. Dahlgren wished to take Fort Sumter, so they would land on the fort to take it with regular U.S. infantry and U.S. Navy sailors and Marines. Sometime during the Union planning phase, Rear Admiral Dahlgren refused to put any of his Navy personnel, including the Marines that would land on the fort, under the control of Quincy or the Union Army. Because of this, the assault of Fort Sumter would use two separate flotillas with two separate command structures. On the late night of September 7th and into the early morning of September 8th, low tide prevented the Union Army's infantry from advancing off Morris Island until later that morning. But by that time, it would be too late to help. Meanwhile, the Navy flotilla led by Commander Thomas H. Stevens Jr. on the Union Monitor of Patapsco was placed in charge against his will. Stevens voiced that he knew nothing of the assault's organization, whereas Admiral Dahlgren responded that there wouldn't be more than six to ten men holding the fort, all he had to do was take possession. So Stevens reluctantly attacked Fort Sumter anyways, without waiting for the Army troops to assist. The Navy forces consisted of 400 Navy and Marine personnel in 25 boats. Less than half these boats were able to land, and those that did land ended up on the side with the most secure wall Fort Sumter instead of the several damaged areas. The sailors and Marines did not have the equipment to scale the walls, and found themselves the recipient of Confederate rifle fire and hand grenades being thrown down on them. To add more bad news, the sailors and Marines on the ships that did not land had opened fire and found they were shooting their own sailors and Marines and not the Confederates. The sailors and Marines that had landed took cover in the shell holes in the wall of the fort. The final straw was when Fort Sumter set up a signal flare and the Confederate warship, the CSS Chicora, started opening fire on the landing party and boats. It was at this point the U.S. Navy boats that could retreat did, leaving behind all the Union sailors and Marines that had landed. Casualties for the Unions were extreme for the number of troops attacking. Eight were killed, 19 wounded, and 105 captured, including the 19 that were wounded. It is estimated that only nine casualties were there for the Confederate forces. This would signal the end of the Union attempts in 1863 to seize Charleston. Join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.